Good morning. I, I've been looking at the lovely table and the decorations, and I believe Ina and Shana. Thank you. It reminds me when I was a boy, we did not have Thanksgiving, but we had Harvest Festival. Maybe it's the same thing. Uh, and I remember the church being decorated like this. So thank you very much. Uh, as you know, next week is a very important week in the life of this congregation. Uh, I believe it should be an announcement up there. Yes, there it is, sorry. Sunday, October 16th. We are going to be, uh, hopefully, all of us will be here and more <laughs> as we are celebrating, or at least we have a gentleman, a person coming to preach for the call. And uh, this is an important step in the life of the congregation. And then be followed by a lunch and obviously a meeting right after the service here in the sanctuary to do the vote. And then you'll be going through for the lunch. So. Please invite your friends um, and those who are not here today, remind them this is important for us to be here to next week. I mean, it's important for you to be here today, but <laughs> it'll be really important for next week. So please let everyone know as much as you can. Thanks. Any other announcements? All right, let us worship God.
Join with me in our call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Know that it is the Lord God who made us and we are God's people. We will worship the Lord with gladness and come into God's presence with song. Know that it is the Lord who made us and we are God's people. We will enter God's gates with praise and thanksgiving. And so we do. A time for all things. Join with me in our prayer of confession, followed by the Lord's Prayer, which will be on the screen. God of all truth, we give thanks for your faithful utterance of reality. In your truthfulness, you have called the world very good. In your truthfulness, you have promised, I have loved you with an everlasting love. In your truthfulness, you have voiced, fear not, I am with you. And you have guaranteed that nothing will separate us from your love in Jesus Christ. And yet we live in a world phony deep, down deep and in which we participate. Ours, Lord, is a seduced world where evil is often called good and good evil. Give us courage to leave this upside down world and to call things by their right names. Overwhelm our fearful need to distort so that we may fall back into your truth telling about us and that above all that we might be tellers of truth. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Good news of the gospel again by faith in Christ. We know God's peace and grace. Thanks be to God. So uh, some of our kids are missing today, but we're glad you're here. Uh, like I said, this was Harvest Festival for us when I grew up as a boy. And uh, the highlight of my time of this time of the year for me as a boy, like say I'm about 10 years old, was to go pick potatoes. Because every year we got three weeks holiday from school to go and pick potatoes. And I got 10 shillings a drill. We had a measured bit. You had to pick all these potatoes and put them in a basket. And then the tractor would come along and they would heave them up into the tractor. And we'd do that all day for a whole week. Made a lot of money. <laughs> and the best part was at lunchtime, we got to run around the farm. It was amazing. That's still a highlight. I still remember that. It was amazing. <laughs> I just wish I could drive the tractor. <laughs> so yeah, that's, this is a very colorful, amazing time of the year for us, isn't it? We call it Thanksgiving. Why do we call it Thanksgiving, by the way? Why was it different from when I was a boy? What's the difference? Anybody? We appreciate God's creation and gifts to us. Yeah, but there's a historical reason why you call it Thanksgiving. The pilgrims. You see, in Scotland, we didn't have any pilgrims. We were the pilgrims. <laughs> so yeah, you call it Thanksgiving because of the pilgrims. We called it Harvest Festival because, I don't know, that's what we did in Europe, I guess. So that's why. But you don't have to go pick potatoes. Too bad. It was the biggest, biggest fun of the year. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this lovely time of the year when the air is clean and the sun is still there and the crops are being brought in and we hear such a great wheat harvest this year. We thank you, God, for, the, for the, all these blessings. Be with our kids, we pray. Watch over them and protect them and may they continue to grow in your love. Amen. Thank you. Ah, oh, we got a computer glitch. Ah, there we are. So as you know, we've been, uh, we've been spending our last few weeks, maybe months, I've lost track of time, um, going through the Gospel of Luke. Well, today we're doing a little switch back to the beginning of the Bible. There we're going to read the story from Genesis 2. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God was not, had not sent rain on the earth and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. And the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first was Hisbon. Can't read that. It winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic Resin and onyx are also there. I didn't know that. 
The name of the second river is the Gibbon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which we still have. It runs along the east side of the Asher, and the fourth river is Ephrates. 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 The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. This is the word of the Lord. Well, for the past month, we have witnessed the, the most amazing storms, devastating storms, and floods, and forest fires all across the world. For example, an unbelievable flood in Pakistan has displaced 33 million people. But that's the population of Canada, by the way. Why was this, why did this happen? Experts say that the reason for the flood in Pakistan was the phenomenal heat waves in April and May when temperatures reached above 40 degrees and in one place, 51 degrees. In Florida, in Puerto Rico, we have just witnessed another powerful hurricane that has literally swept away whole neighborhoods. Not working, there. That's the picture that used to be Fort Myers. This is it, the same picture now. Pretty mind boggling, eh? Also in Eastern Canada, we have just witnessed Hurricane Flora, which also has devastated the whole region. Homes, businesses, all leveled, people died. Up over 120 now in Florida. And nor we should we forget too quickly the forest fires that raged in BC and California. What's happening? What's going on? And what do we as Christians say to this? What, is it, what does this mean for our future? and the future of the planet. Is there a Christian response to this? Is it not obvious that what is now happening seemingly much more frequently and with much more devastating effect, are these storms and floods happening more often or is it just our imagination? We have two creation stories in the Bible. One in Genesis 1, a totally different one, and a much later one in Genesis 2. And we have read portions of the second one, where we are called to be stewards of this garden. So what better time than this holiday Thanksgiving weekend to be reminded of the blessing God the Creator has shared with all humanity, namely a beautiful planet set in space in this amazing universe. But moreover, it reminds us of our responsibility to take care of it. We are told by this ancient Jewish scripture that we are the stewards. So what does it mean to be a steward? It means to take responsibility for. God's intention for us is to ensure the well-being of all living things. Indeed, one could argue that as we were at the pinnacle, we were at the pinnacle of the creative process, we were the last ones created in the order in Genesis, 
We were made not only to be in relationship with this one who made us, but we are in relationship with everything around us in this garden. Stewards of the garden. I don't know how you are as a gardener. <laughs> I'm not much of a gardener. I cut the grass dutifully when it has to be, but that's, my wife does all the other fiddly things, you know, and plants and weeding, and I watch with admiration. But we receive specific instructions to care for this garden to manage it, to be responsible, responsible for it. In other words, to be human is to be in relationship to this creator and with creation. And so we, Christians, above anyone else, ought to take this seriously, this creation mandate. Because we are people bound to God. So any time is a good time to be reminded of this creation mandate. But surely there is no better time than today. Thanksgiving weekend. So let us focus today on stewardship. And in particular, our responsibility to be stewards of creation. On Monday, as I made my way up the 8th Fairway, Dundas Golf and Country Club, those luscious, luxuriant green fairways, and the golden trees all around as I made my way to that green in the distance. And who cares where the ball goes when you're admiring it? Well, yes, we do. But the trees set against that blue sky, it was awe-inspiring, not my shot, but this. <laughs> the second creation story that we read in Genesis 2 tells us that one of the first things God did was to create a garden where the first family were to live. And we notice that the trees that grew there were pleasing to the eye and to the stomach. Their fruit was mouth-watering and very lovely to look at. What does that tell me? God has an eye for beauty. In the middle of the Garden of Eden were gorgeous trees, plants, and streams. And God put Adam into the middle of this beauty. And he said, look after it. We are told that Adam was to till and keep it. The Hebrew word for till generally refers to the servant, the service a slave has to a master. And the word keep means to preserve for future generations. So the creative mandate, the creation mandate given to Adam and to each one of us asks the human family to serve and preserve what God has created. So what world are we passing on to our children and our grandchildren? We have two different stories of creation, don't we? I don't know if you knew that, but they're different. Genesis 1 is very different from Genesis 2. But in each, we have neither history or myth. I want you to notice that. This is not history, this is poetry. As Walter Brueggemann, the famous uh, Old Testament scholar, reminds us, it's rather proclamation of God's decisive and sovereign dealing with creation. That's what these texts tell us. They're not telling us, they're not giving us a, a 
They're not giving us a video account of what happened. It's a poem. In Genesis origin stories, Israel describes God's covenant relationship with creation. It's a faith statement that they're giving us. Written during the exile in Babylon, hundreds of years later, because they had to say something about the beginning. And they had to set it against the gods of Babylon. And this, this cre these creation stories state unequivocally that God is bound to the world and the world to God. In the poem, Israel speaks this way of God's action. Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Let us have dominion over them. The dominion that he talks about here that he describes in Genesis 1 is similar to the one in Genesis 2. The, world me the word means to take responsibility for. Not to be an overlord, but really to be nurturing. God's intention for us is to ensure the well-being of all that lives and breathes on the planet. So let's repeat what we have said before. We have been called by God to be stewards of the garden. To care for it, to manage it, and to be responsible for it. Caring for creation is one of the top priorities set out in the Genesis story. Called to serve and preserve. Well, we live in the 21st century. A lot has happened in the last couple of hundred years, isn't there? How do we feel we're doing in this creation mandate? How are we caring for the planet? Have we not in fact been rather negligent? We have delighted in the resources that we've been able to take from the earth. Oil, gas, minerals. In order to make our lives more pleasant, which who doesn't like that? We learned, we have learned, especially over the past couple of centuries, that we are polluting everything, the soil and the atmosphere. And we do this through various means. For example, in our waste management, we dump our refuse on the land. We have inadequate landfills, and these are major contributors to soil, soil pollution. We burn fossil fuels at an alarming rate in our plants and refineries, in our cars. Get electric cars, it says. And we're all contributing to climate change, which is happening before our eyes. Water, land, and air are all profoundly affected by our lifestyle. Somehow this pattern has to change or we are doomed, folks. How easily we forget that God loves this material world. He loves the universe. And he loves planet Earth. You see, sometimes our emphasis on the spiritual, which we're all pretty good at... <laughs> on our personal peace and our salvation has obscured this fact of God's earthly delight. The psalmist was not so easily misled. She revels in God's delighted, delightful creation. 
Listen again to her rhapsody. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. I want you to see with her eyes what she's saying. Giving drink to every wild animal. The wild asses quench their thirst. And by the streams, the birds of the air have their habitation. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow of the cattle and plants for people to use. You bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart. It's in the Bible, folks. As Christians, we need to recover this reverence for creation. We need to echo more of our Jewish cousin's theology that is rooted in the earth. It is the earthiness of the Old Testament that has always attracted me. That has all but disappeared from our theology. We have focused, may I say, perhaps too exclusively, we Christians, on the spirituality that's at the center of the New Testament. But what we have to remember is that the New Testament is framed by Greek philosophy. That's what forms the backdrop to the New Testament. Plato, Aristotle, the great philosophers of Greece. We have, it's caused us to forget the earthy Jewish emphasis of the Old Testament. We forget too quickly that our Lord himself was enamored by creation. His, his words are full of it. So it's not surprising that, that Jesus himself draws a lot of his spiritual teaching from creation. The lilies of the field. We need to get that back to the Old Testament, folks. We need to get back to our Jewish cousin's theology. I want you all to sing this. Well, maybe not sing it, but at least, come on, next slide. Yeah. Here's what I want you all to say together. <coughs> this is, again, from Psalm 104. <coughs> Let's say it together. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. you get it? material world not just our spirits <laughs> gotta get back to that folks in the name of the Father, Son and Spirit Amen Let's stand together.
Today we're going to bring our tithes and our offerings to God in thanksgiving. Gracious and generous God, we bring these gifts in gratitude for all that we have received from your hand. Bless and multiply them just as Jesus multiplied the loaves and fishes. Use them so others can taste your love in our community and in your world. Through grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bring our prayers to God. There will be a, a time for a silent prayer as at the end. Generous God, as we give thanks for the harvest of the earth and all the goodness that sustains us, we pray that you will show us how to live respectfully in creation and pr protect all that is precious to you. Wherever harvests have been disappointing, and where it's been severely challenged, as in the breadbasket of the world in Ukraine. May it be that in spite of the setbacks, food will be sent out to the hungry of the world. According to the World Food Program, up to 811 million people go to bed hungry every night. That's a lot of people. And the number of people facing severe food insecurity has doubled from 135 million to 276 million. That's more than the population of Canada and the United States. And that's all happened in the last two years. In places like Ethiopia and Kenya and Nigeria and South Sudan and Yemen and Haiti, to name but a few, millions of people are deeply affected. And so we pray for those peoples and their children's that doors might be opened through the United Nations <clears throat> and the World Food Bank for them to find relief. Generous God, we pray for the good of your world and the common good of our community. And where there is strife and hostility between peoples and nations as there is in Ukraine, and all that they are suffering. Inspire leaders to show wisdom and courage as we face these serious issues. We pray for people in places hard hit by floods and fires and tornadoes and hurricanes, especially in Eastern Canada and in Florida and in Puerto Rico. We remember today that next week there's a person coming to preach for the call to minister here at West Flamborough. And so much prayer and work has preceded this important day in the life of this congregation. May your spirit be pleased to lead the candidate and the congregation that your will, your sovereign will, might be done next week. We continue to pray for those living with illness, 
and for all that may be struggling with anxiety or even despair. We especially remember Roy's fervor today for his healing and peace of mind and for his wife, Sandra. And we continue to remember Marjorie as she heals and recovers from surgery. And there may be many others in our hearts and minds and we bring them to you now in the silence. We raise all of these prayers to you, Lord, in faith and trust that your will is always the best one for us. Thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, and dominion before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's stand together. Amen.